Good afternoon. Um, thank you and welcome um, near far wherever you are. We're glad that you were able to take some time out of your schedule to attend the frequently asked question about manufactured housing webinar. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to attend a few of our other sessions, and this is a continuation on, uh, on that um, same track. And what we're going to be uh, identifying, we're going to be talking about of those FAQs. But before we go over the agenda, I want to give you a couple of other items, some housekeeping elements. So this is going to be running from 3 to 4 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time. We're um, and so as an attendee, your mic is off and your camera, your, your mic is off and your cameras are off as well. Um, if you're having any type of challenges of hearing or, or any technology type of questions, please, by all means, utilize the chat feature that's down in the right hand corner of your um, computer. Um, but however, if you have a question um, and you'd like to get that addressed, um, by all means, please also utilize the Q&A feature that's there on the right hand side for all questions so that um, when we get and then make sure that you post it to all panelists so that we can see that. Um, this webinar is being recorded and then, of course, afterwards, um, the video uh, transcription and Q&As will be posted to the HUD exchange. Um, after the webinar, we will be providing you with a link down so that you can, in the event that you um, miss one of our other webinars, this is an opportunity for you to um, be able to review that information. Um, so we're going to provide that, that for you. Um, today, um, we're, uh, I'm joined, my name is, I don't even know if I tell you my name, I'm sorry, but I might want to do that, huh? <laughs> Hi, I'm Deitra Coles. I'm one of the senior consultants with Capital Access. I am joined today by um, Catherine May Rose, who's one of our also one of our senior consultants, and we're also um, with Grant Johnson. He is our director of policy and HUD TA. So they're going to be co-presenting, co-facilitating with me today. Um, so we have a lot of information that we're going to be going over, and this is your agenda. We're going to talk about FAQs centered around manufactured housing versus other types of factory built housing, um, eligibility compliance, ownership and governance, disaster resilience, sustainability and energy efficiency, tax title, finance and insurance. Um, and in the event when we go over any of this information and there are some questions that a new question that comes up, feel free to drop it in and we're going to do our best to be able to address those at the end of the presentation. But to get us started, we have a wonderful introduction um, that is coming to us from James Martin Esquire. He is senior housing specialist in the Office of Manufactured Housing Programs at HUD and you have our attention. Thank you for being here, James. Thank you, Diatra. I really appreciate that uh, that wonderful introduction. And on behalf of my boss, uh, Teresa Payne, the administrator of the Office of Manufactured Housing Programs with HUD, I wanna say, you know, we're really excited to be working with both Capital Access and our partners at CPD here at HUD. Um, we think that the work that all of the panelists and you as attendees are doing on this particular issue is really important and as, uh, as it was said, you know, my name is James Martin. I'm a senior housing specialist for HUD's Office of Manufactured Housing Programs. And we are an independent office now, as of the summer at HUD, that reports directly to the Federal Housing Commissioner, who's also Assistant Secretary of Housing. So uh, FHA loans and that kind of financing, we're, we're tied in with that to a certain extent. And many of you may actually be surprised that we are an independent office. Um, as somebody who has worked in this office uh, on and off for a little, over a decade, probably more than I would like to admit. Um, you know, it's it's a great and positive surprise to me that we are we've now been elevated, and I think we're really excited that we can work across HUD and with our partners in the community and partners in you know, the NGO and other spaces to really make an effort to to address our affordable housing problems, particularly when it comes to use of manufactured homes. Um, you know, prior to us being an independent office. We were part of the Office of Risk Management and Regulatory Affairs, 
So while we loved our, our relationship with our sister office in risk, uh, we really think this is a great opportunity to elevate manufactured housing and showcase how it can really be a meaningful solution to the affordability issues that we're seeing throughout the country when it comes to housing. Um, and I would say with that, you know, a lot of that is, is part of uh, the current administration, the Biden Harris's administration's uh, recognition of the critical role that manufactured housing can play. And I know that you all being here also recognize that critical importance of manufactured housing and, and helping our communities to provide affordable, accessible housing. Um, so we we are now a dedicated office all our own. And our major task is to oversee the construction of manufactured homes. And we promote manufactured homes beyond our construction standards as a modern and affordable path to home ownership. Um, to give you some historical background on who we are, we were started uh, way back in 1974. Um, before 1974, manufactured homes were regulated state to state. There was no nationwide regulatory body. So if you wanted to sell a house in Florida or in North Carolina or in Montana, um, you would have to basically conform to whatever the local building code was for that state for a manufactured home. But in 1974, we created a federally preemptive building code. Um, to my knowledge, it's the only one in the country, which means that a manufactured home that is certified to our standards can be shipped and cited anywhere in the United States, um, regardless of the local building code. And that's, that's an interesting thing for me, working with local building codes that a lot of times they don't realize that we are a federally preemptive program. So to the extent that we regulate it in our code, that is in our authority. And it's not something that a local building code can opine on. Um, you know, under the act, when we, when we started this building code, we inspect the factories. We make sure that all the designs that are being produced conform to our standards. We monitor um, retailer lots. We monitor installation. Um, through our state partners and also through some states that we ourselves administer to make sure that homes are installed properly. And we also have a dispute resolution program to help homeowners and manufacturers figure out, you know, there's an issue with the home who should be responsible for taking care of that. You know, I think one of the things that we do, which is a little bit different from stick built housing is that we really do have a comprehensive consumer protection scheme, which goes beyond just regular warranties. And that's something which is, I think, really innovative about us that we want to make sure that a manufactured home, because it is a federally uh, federally regulated thing, really does meet a, a high standard of quality and reliability uh, for the homeowner. And you know, when when I look at this industry, I think we're really doing that. I, I was talking before we came on here about how in the last twenty years the product has really grown by leaps and bounds, and in a lot of cases. You know, for me, as somebody who works in, I can tell you a lot of times which house is manufactured, and which one is stick built. So I think that's something that's really, really great for us. Um, you know, beyond that, when we do our regulatory thing, really, it's really important to us, and it's congressionally mandated to us that we have input from our various stakeholders in what we do. So we have something called the Manufactured Housing Consensus Committee, which is an advisory committee which consists of 21 members and is uh, headed by our administrator, who is a non-voting committee and that's seven producers uh, seven consumer groups and then seven in general interest or state actors so typically for us we have seven of seven members from the manufacturers seven uh representing consumers or users of manufactured homes and then we have uh usually state officials who usually work for one of our state our state government partners who will come in and when we meet we look at updating our standards it's not something that's set in time you know set in stone we really want to be on the cutting edge and make sure that our code allows the consumer to have the best possible home they can get um, using the most modern technology and the most innovative methods of building that um, to provide a really top quality product. And I, I would say that from our perspective, we really are delivering on that. Um, you know, in the last three years, something that might be interesting to you is we've really stepped up our efforts to promote the availability. Um, of manufactured homes and during COVID-19, that was actually something that spurred us, you know, as a lot of people did to kind of be creative about how we were going to make this product work. So um, you know, we first were looking at supply chain. Everybody knows how that was, you know, getting all sorts of things from toilet paper on up during COVID. That was something that people were dealing with. So we found a lot of ways to be constructive with that and flexible. Um, and we really kind of built on what we were doing during COVID. So now, you know, where we are with the building code is, I think our manufacturers have 
historically speaking, some unprecedented flexibility in what they can build. I mean, they're still building units which are safe, they're affordable, they're reliable. I, mean, I think, you know, I, for myself, I would live in a manufactured home. Uh, I was telling people in some cases I've seen manufactured homes that are honestly a lot nicer than what I live in. So I think it's a great product. Um, and I think that we're really, we're really on the cutting edge of making sure that consumers have as many options as possible and are able to have an affordable yet really you know, a, a home that they can be proud of. Um, you know, one other thing that we're also working with in our office is the finance side. And, uh, you know, for us, one thing we want to make sure is that manufactured home consumers, people who are interested in this, will have access to financing that will make that dream possible for them. So one thing that we're stepping into that we haven't traditionally done is we're working on trying to expand FHA loan programs to provide that access to home ownership to more consumers, um, whether it be someone who is going to buy that unit and you continue to lease the land on it or somebody who is putting on a piece of property that they're going to own and they're going to buy as part of a broader transaction. So that's really important to us. Um, but I want to say, you know, it really is important to me and it's important to Teresa, my boss, that you all are here and you're interested in this. I think this particular grant is a great opportunity for the product. It's a great opportunity for us to really help people um, who, who, frankly, a lot of times, you know, the idea of being a homeowner probably seems out of reach to them. And this is really something great that you all are participating in. And we really do appreciate everything you're doing. And we know that, you know, the last manufactured housing webinar, um, you participants, you asked a lot of really thoughtful questions. And unfortunately, we didn't have the time to answer all of them, but we wanted to make sure that there was additional opportunity. So there's now this extra webinar. And, you know, your questions are important. And I think they need, you know, they need consideration because we definitely want you to be a part of what we're trying to accomplish here to, to make home ownership and make affordable housing reality for more people. Um, so on that note, I'm going to wrap up and I'm really glad you're here. I wanted to say if any of you have any questions about my office in particular, uh, my email address, I'm going to try to put it in the chat as well. It's james.martin at hud.gov. And I will be more than happy to talk to you and help you. And if I don't know the answer to your question, I'm going to try my best to find somebody who does. But, you know, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to the Atra. Uh, once again, we're really excited that you're here and we're glad that you're taking this time to, you know, really do a lot of good, I think, for our country and for our communities and making home ownership and affordable housing reality for more people. So, on that, uh, thanks a lot, Deatra, and uh, I'll leave it back to you. All right. Thank you so very much. So, um, as we discussed, uh, initially through the, uh, agenda portion, we've got a lot of information. So we're going to get right into it. Um, first, we're going to talk about the uh, Q and A's that was centered around manufactured housing versus other types of factory built type of housing. Um, so 1 of the questions that we received was what is the difference between mobile home and a trailer? Well, mobile homes are constructed pre 1976 that they're designed to be transported to a site permanently installed. Um, whereas trailers are designed to be towed behind a vehicle or they are uh, designed for only temporary housing. So, our, that, which moves us into another question, uh, are park models considered manufactured housing? The answer is no. In park models, they're not constructed to that code, the HUD code that um, Mr. Martin was talking about as well. And we're going to actually talk more about that code and making sure in case you didn't have that citation, we will be giving that to you um, very shortly. So stay tuned. Moving on to question three, where can I get data on the number of pre-1976 mobile homes in my community? Well, unfortunately, there's not a central database that, that holds all of that information um, regarding the mobile homes and community. However, the US Centru uh, Census um, Manufactured Housing Survey is available and it provides data that is on shipments, the sales, and some other pertinent information related to manufactured housing. Now, the thing of it is, is that in some states and local areas, there might be um, some more localized resources. 
Um, so you'll need to check in your state and your locality, whether that's through your planning department, GIS departments within your um, relative locations. But if you're looking for uh, information, just the data on shipments and sales, the best place to look for that is um, the US Census Manufacturer Housing Survey. We're going to go into this robust question. Are boxable tiny homes and shipping container homes considered manufactured housing? We're seeing a lot more of those, right? Well, uh, boxable tiny homes and shipping containers are, even if they're being converted into housing units, are subject to what? The local bu building codes. Um, so they're like modular or site built homes um, in that relation. However, they're not necessarily built um, to the HUD code, but for that to be accepted for these types of units to be accepted as a HUD, co a HUD code manufactured um, home, there are three things that is needed and check out the bullet points that are below. One is that they are built um, under the Manufactured Home Construction Safety Standards Program that is identified under CFR Part 3, 3280. That's HUD's Manufactured Home Construction Guidelines um, and Regulations. And then also that the safety standards of the manufacturer participation under the manufactured home procedural and enforcement regulations are followed, which is found in 24 CFR part 3282. So it would have to follow those requirements. A second element is that it has to be um, transported in one or more sections with a permanent chassis. Now that can be of a um, metal composition. Um, there's other compositions that are there, but there would have to be transport transported um, in one or more sections with that permanent chassis that's there. And then also the third element is that there has to be a label, that red certification label that is affixed to the exterior of each of those transportation sections. Um, so that would, at that point in time, then um, only if it has those three elements, unless it meets all three of those elements, then it is not um, considered to be a HUD code manufactured home. So keep that in mind. Question number five deals with, will modular constructed homes be approved by HUD to increase the inventory of affordable housing? And as Mr. James Martin um, brought to, you know, in all of our introductions that we've had thus far in the webinar, we know that HUD is strongly um, for the creation of more affordable housing because it is so needed throughout the country. Um, so, in order to, um, to address this, HUD has broadly supported the efforts that, that to increase the amount of affordable housing that is available, including modular housing and other innovations. Um, and there is a link that is there that we're going to be providing you once the PowerPoint has been posted on the HUD exchange, but they have their annual innovate, innovative housing showcase. And if you haven't had the opportunity to check that out, you should. So definitely shows the support because the there's varying models um, in order for us to um, address the, the lack of affordable housing that we have in our relative communities. So um, check that out. Modular housing, is one of the approaches, okay, to creating um, housing um, and affordable housing within our community. But something that you need to keep in mind that then is when it comes to the financing element portion, um, it can't be you. You cannot utilize your CDBG program funds 
except under certain limited circumstances. And we're not going to um, exactly get all into those right now, but uh, just so that you know, um, you know, as far as modular housing, it is a, uh, it's a viable option. And when we're trying to increase the number of units that are there, but there are some rules and guidelines also that must be followed in reference to that. We're going to move on to, uh, I think I, I missed one. Nope, I did. I did. I went too fast. Sorry, I missed one. Sorry. Let me go back to. No, I think you're good. Oh, I did. I did do that. Okay. You did <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, but Catherine, can you help us with eligibility and compliance? Some of the areas that's there, please. Thanks. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to walk you through some questions that we received in previous webinars um, pertaining to general questions around eligibility and compliance. So this is a broad category, so there's a lot to get into, but um, so question six, does the HUD code supersede state and local codes for manufactured housing? Um, so the answer is somewhat nuanced in the sense that in, it doesn't, um, you can follow state and local codes, but in order for a unit to meet the definition of a manufactured home and to qualify for the federal assistance that we've been discussing, it does have to align with the HUD code as previously referenced. Um, the HUD code is what's considered federally preemptive. So state and local governments um, are not permitted to uh, impose their own standards that are different from the HUD code, again, if they're trying to fund uh, those activities with their federal assistance. Um, but the HUD code does have some variation for um, aspects that are more local variations. So climate considerations or um, you know, resilience measures for hurricane prone areas. So there is some flexibility there. Um, when it comes to installation standards, state and local governments can impose their own installation standards as long as those meet the minimum standards in um, the minimum federal standards under 24 CFR part 3285. Next. So question seven, how does Davis-Bacon and related acts, otherwise known as DBRA, apply to manufactured housing activities? Um, so the answer is this is really nuanced. Uh, in general, of course, Davis-Bacon does apply to federally assisted um, construction, public construction activities over $2,000 in federal funds. And then you also have the requirement that um, any projects, residential projects with eight or more units that are funded with CDBG or residential projects with 12 or more units that are funded with home do also have to pay prevailing wage and are subject to DBRA provisions as well. Um, so that's all covered in the HUD handbook 1344.1. Just as a side note, um, that handbook is super helpful for a lot of different uh, questions related to federal labor standards, not just um, this. So I do recommend that you check it out. Uh, but specifically for manufactured housing activities, Davis-Bacon is going to apply on a case-by-case -case basis, so it is really going to depend on several aspects of the project, um, including the size of the project, the scope of the project, um, and you know some, some aspects of how the manufactured housing community is structured. Um, therefore, the recommendation is, is that if you are funding manufactured housing activities that you think might apply, um, you know, might be Davis-Bacon applicable, then you should check with your field office representative to um, speak with them about whether they um, think that those would be applicable to your activities. Um, just as a final note, um, the Davis-Bacon final rule was recently published. Um, there are some changes to the obligations for grantees, subrecipients, and contractors. Um, so it, it is linked there. Again, you can um, check that out for more information. Um, but we don't want to say a whole lot about that right now, just because, again, it is very new. So additional guidance is going to be forthcoming. Question eight, can CDBG be used for infrastructure activities that are located within a privately owned manufactured housing community? And if so, which national objectives may be used? Um, so the answer is, in general, the answer is going to be yes. So CDBG can fund uh, public facilities and improvements that are located within manufactured housing communities 
Um, if those are publicly owned or owned by a nonprofit, then it would be considered a public facility or improvement. Um, and you could potentially undertake those activities under either LMA, LMC, or LMH, national objectives. Um, you also have the option, if it is talking about residential structures that need to be connected to um, public water and sewer lines, then that can be done as a rehab activity under the LMH national objective, and that is low mod housing. Um, and then you also have the option, um, so if you're talking about a manufactured housing community that is owned by a private party and there's a need for um, infrastructure improvements to what we'll call the common areas, so maybe the streets or the sidewalks or, um, you know, the, the main water and sewer lines, um, grantees do have an option to assist those private entities and make those improvements. Um, they can be considered beneficiaries and receive those CDBG funds for infrastructure improvements um, as rehab activities under LMH. So that would be um, similar to if you were doing rehab activities under um, to a multifamily or a small rental program, um, you know, that, that would be owned by a private party as well. So um, it's somewhat similar to that. Um, however, if you do choose to assist a private entity um, in a manufactured housing community, um, it is strongly encouraged that you um, take some steps to make sure that, um, you know, the residents are protected from eviction, that you have long-term pad leases, anti-flip clauses, um, and long-term affordability requirements. So, again, just trying to make sure that um, that project really is in the best interests of the manufactured housing residents, as opposed to just primarily benefiting that um, owner of that community. Question nine, is payment usually required upfront to purchase new manufactured housing units? And if so, can CDBG funds be advanced for this purpose? Um, so the short answer is, is that this is gonna depend. Uh, it's gonna vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, it is common for them to require a down payment upfront, and then the remaining balance would be um, paid after the unit has been delivered and installed. Um, HUD hasn't issued any specific guidance on this subject, so grantees can determine how to structure that activity in the way that um, is going to be most impactful and follows their own policies and procedures. Uh, there are some general conditions um, considerations to keep in mind, though. So if a grantee does choose to pay directly the manufacturer um, any, any portion of that amount prior to delivery, um, it is recommended that you consult with your legal representative first. Um, so it's gonna, you know, hopefully your purchase agreement has terms and conditions for spelled out as far as what recourse is available to you if um, that product doesn't get uh, delivered and installed like it's supposed to. Um, but that is something that you should um, make sure that you've talked with your legal representative to make sure that you're clear on what, what your recourse is to recapture any portion of those funds that, um, you know, that don't go towards an activity that's delivered as agreed and meets a national objective. Um, you also have the option to wait and structure your program as reimbursing the homeowner or the subrecipient after installation is complete. Um, so this is an option to you as well. Um, it just depends on, you know, how likely it is that those parties are going to um, be able to fund that activity upfront. So that would be a consideration as well. Um, either way, regardless of how you choose to structure the activity, um, you do need to make sure that you're documenting that a national objective is met prior to the closeout of the activity. Um, aside from that, you know, when you are entering the activity in IDIS or DRGR, um, you know, you have the you have some flexibility to structure the activity setup and the draws in such a way that you avoid um, creating a flagged activity. But, um, you know, while still uh, structuring the payment, you know, however, is is best for the activity and for you. Question 10, can a manufactured home have a permanent chassis without being permanently affixed? Um, so the answer is yes, in the sense that the permanent chassis 
um, isn't necessarily um, the same as the permanent foundation. So in the photo there, you can see that, um, you know, that metal frame on the bottom of the unit, that's the permanent chassis. Um, those can be made from um, steel or wood. So there's not necessarily a requirement that they have to be metal, um, but that's what it looks like. So as you can see, it's, it's not, um, you could also have a foundation um, however, you do have some considerations and some reason to require that um, that unit, including the chassis, do need to be permanently affixed. So, as we've discussed in the new CPD notice, um, you have uh, HUD has found that um, products that um, FHA products uh, are, that are not permanently affixed um, are considered chattel. So, if it's not permanently affixed, it is more likely to be considered personal property. Um, which is uh, an important consideration because personal property isn't eligible for CDBG. Um, so you do want to um, still make sure that it's permanently fixed um, to the to the site. Question 11. If the owner of a CDBG assisted manufactured home on a leased pad is evicted and the pad owner assumes ownership of the unit, Who's responsible for repaying the CDBG funds if the manufactured homeowner didn't reside in the home for long enough um, to forgive the loan? Um, so this is assuming that a forgivable loan was, um, you know, was used to assist that homeowner um, that possibly required them to occupy the unit for maybe you know, a certain number of years um, in order for that loan to be forgiven. Um, so this is kind of a program design question. So, um, before you even start this activity, you would want to really think through um, how you're going to ideally prevent this situation from taking place, but also then have um, some guardrails in place um, to handle it in case it does. Um, the one consideration is going to be that um, you should make sure that the pad lease um, stipulates uh, really specifically conditions under which the pad owner can assume ownership of the unit. And then you're going to be also looking at the subsidy agreement um, to make sure that it has some kind of conditions based on the lease. Um, it should spell out how and by whom the outstanding subsidy should be repaid. Um, it is an option to require the lease and subsidy agreements to include a stipulation saying that if the homeowner doesn't uh, reside in that unit for the required length of time to require the unit to be sold and then any subsidy outstanding be repaid to the grantee. That's not to say that's necessarily the only way to handle this situation, um, but those are some considerations to hopefully help you think it through on the front end. Um, also, the CPD notice um, that we discussed in webinar two, it does note that you have the option um, and are recommended um, to require, if you're, if you're assisting um, manufactured housing units that are on rented sites, um, you might want to require that recorded deed restrictions be placed against that property um, or and or that a long term lease agreement be in place for that site just to make sure that people aren't um, that people are able to remain there for an extended period of time. Um, now, that's not specifically going to speak to an issue about eviction like due to non-payment or something, um, but at least it, it will hopefully ensure some um, long-term benefit for the manufactured homeowner. Um, you also do have the option to, um, you know, consider supporting um, acquisition of manufactured housing communities by the residents as well, just to... Um, increase the security, preserve affordability, and prevent eviction. Um, so that's also just, those are some longer term considerations. Question 12, can CDBG funds be used to transport a manufactured home to the site where it will be permanently located? Um, so the answer is it depends. Um, if the purchase agreement, so it depends on how the purchase agreement is structured. Um, so if it does include delivery and it's um, you know being funded by the same manufacturer that's delivering it and it's all one purchase agreement, then it can potentially be funded by CDBG as part of the project costs. Um, but if it's a separate cost, it's being done by a separate contractor or firm, um, then it would most likely be considered part of installation. So again, it, it just depends on how you structure it. 
Um, and just to recap for anyone who wasn't with us in the earlier webinars, um, installation is considered new construction of housing under CDBG. So um, the acquisition of the units is now eligible under the new notice, but the installation is still considered new construction, um, but the transport then, as we say, it, it just depends. So there are specific uh, very limited conditions under which new construction of housing is eligible, um, either if it's being done by a CUBDO or if it's um, being funded with DR funds through a very specific waiver that permits new construction of housing or if it's house of, housing of last resort. So those are really the only three circumstances in which you could do new construction or installation um, rather with CDBG. So question 13, uh, following on those lines, where can I find the requirements for CUBDOs, community-based development organizations? Um, so not gonna walk through this, but um, you see three links on this slide. So there are some regulations for the entitlement program. Um, there's some specific requirements under the HCDA for the state CDBG um, for a neighborhood-based nonprofit organization. And then in the Indian CDBG program, um, there's a specific regulation for CUPDOs as well. So you can refer to those. Question 14, how will the Build America Buy America Act affect CDBG assisted manufactured housing activities? Um, so uh, Build America Buy America is um, still quite new uh, requirement. Um, it does require a domestic preference for iron, steel, construction materials and manufactured products on federally funded infrastructure projects if those projects aren't exempt. So there are um, some waivers that have been issued that exempt certain types of projects or certain sizes of projects, but otherwise um, federally funded infrastructure projects are subject to BABA. Um, so the thing to note with manufactured housing activities is that the term infrastructure as it's defined in Build America by America, it does cover buildings and real property, including uh, anything associated with housing construction and rehabilitation. So um, there's not a specific categorical exemption for housing activities or manufactured housing. So if you're used to thinking of infrastructure in terms of roads and bridges, um, it is a little bit broader than that. So that is something to keep in mind. However, it is worth noting that um, there are some exceptions where it doesn't apply and a lot of your manufactured housing activities are gonna fall into one of those. So the two probably that are gonna be most common for you is um, there is an exemption for emergencies. So if your activities are being funded totally by DR, MIT or um, CV funds, then they would not be subject to Build America, Buy America. And then if the total project cost, and that is the total project cost from all sources, doesn't exceed the simplified acquisition threshold, then your activities would be exempt from Build America, Buy America. So um, that's currently 250,000. Um, so it is very likely that a lot of your activities will fall into one of those, but in general, um, if they don't, then there is a good chance that, um, that this provision could apply to your activities. With that said, um, I would refer you to that notice that's linked at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's an extremely detailed um, notice about how Build America Buy America applies to CBD activities. So um, that does have a lot of information in terms of um, a phased schedule for when the different um, aspects of Build America Buy America will take effect, as well as a more complete listing of all of the waivers um, so definitely check that out for more information. Um, there are also some um, webinars on the HUD exchange that are about Build America, Buy America. So those would also have more information. So I'm gonna turn it back to Day Turnout. She's gonna talk us through some questions about ownership and governance. All right, thank you, Catherine. Question 15 is centered around how is a resident owned community ROC different from a CLT or a community land trust. Well, with a land trust, it is owned by the nonprofit. And so that the community rents the pads or the, the, the section or the foundation in which the manufactured house would be placed on, um, those are rented to the actual owners of the manufactured housing. 
So, but when you think about ROC, um, we wanna make sure that resident owned communities, those are organized um, in a way so that the residents have not only owned their home, but they also have a cooperative share in the housing um, corporation. So that's the, the two differences. One is um, owned um, and uh, operated by the nonprofit, and then it's rented out to those individual manufactured, um, manufactured housing owners. Um, whereas an ROC um, with a resident owned community, then they own the not only just their home, but they also have a, a cooperative uh, share in the housing corporation in itself. Now, CLTs, the community land trust are their main um, purpose is to um, preserve and ensure long long term affordability. Now, there is they operate under the National Affordable Housing Act, along with its its amended consolidated appropriations act, but they may hold and exercise different purchase options also allow for first right of refusal and other preemptive rights to preserve um, that particular the affordability of the home assisted um, developed CLT and that's home not just the the home where you live and we're talking about home um, investment partnership uh, funding and so that is the home assisted housing developed um, by the CLT um, and, and so that that's the difference that's there. CLTs can also um, incorporate resident engagements, but they're not inherently owned or operated by the residents that um, own the manufactured housing um, actual units. So they there's an engagement, but it once again there's a separation there based on the share of the cooperative um, that between the owners um, of the various manufactured housing versus a nonprofit who then rents out to the individual um, manufactured housing owners. Question 16 ask, is a resident owned community comparable to a homeowners association? Well, it's basically in the basic function, they they both have um, the ability to their their the sense of community. Um, all together and they have a, that basic function, um, but there are some variations in the way that it is organized and structured and also its administrative practices. So resident owned communities are focusing on the resident as far as that protection. Whereas an HOA, a homeowners association, or even a condominium association is looking at it from a holistic approach of the actual community. So those are the, the two um, differences that are there that you wanna make note of. And then our other question that we had under this section um, is um, a, pretty involved. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read it off the screen. So recently, this is something that uh, many of us are facing in wherever we are, we're, this exact situation. Recently, there's been an increase of investors purchasing manufactured housing communities from mom and pops, okay? Owners that are starting retiring. These companies, they've changed their policies and procedures so that they are less forgiving when rent is due and they're quick to evict. They've also um, raised the rent lot rents to the point where it becomes no longer affordable. Wouldn't replacing these manufactured housing units for the manufactured homeowner only increase lot rent further and drive more investors to join the market, making manufactured housing units no longer the housing option for your LMI community? Well, you know, improvements um, to a manufactured housing community, it increases the property values. And yes, it doesn't attract um, investors from the outside. And that's what we all face in any of our communities in which there that is undergoing any type of um, redevelopment. However, with the CLTs and uh, with ROCs, those are two examples or strategies 
um, that can be utilized to help preserve the affordability and protect the residents. So those are two different options that in some locations, you may find that that is the route that you that you would want to go in order to have that affordability um, continue to be preserved for the residents versus um, the market that is being absorbed by um, many outside investors. Uh, Grant, I was wondering if you can take us through the next session of uh, disaster resilience Q and A's. Thank you, Deja. So, uh, questions eighteen and nineteen: um, Can CDBG uh, DR, that's disaster recovery, or other HUD funds be used to replace pre nineteen seventy six mobile homes? or pre-1994 units with manufactured housing units that now meet the HUD code and are more resilient? Uh, the basic answer is yes. Uh, so it's nice to have a, a straightforward response there. Um, you can replace substandard units or homes with um, a, you know, an improved manufactured housing um, home under all of these different regulatory authorizations. So CDBG, CDBG DR and home for all of those programs, you have the citations there. And um, if you're looking for more detail there uh, as to why or how, yes. So across the board, across your different funding sources, CDBG, CDBG DR, home, uh, home program funds, they can all be used to fund the replacement of manufactured housing units, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, again, as a follow on to that question, where can you find more information um, on um, high wind performance? It's really going to vary um, on the individual manufacturer of the home and or some of the local codes or requirements. So um, I would start with the manufacturer because each of them have to meet a minimum standard for the HUD code. But then in certain areas where high wind is a concern, they may have added additional um, features such as uh, roof straps or tie downs and things like that to address wind, more aggressive wind shear. Um, question 20. So what are some of the examples of additional resilience features? So really resiliency is a, is a hot topic these days because we're seeing uh, more and more natural disasters impacting our communities. And um, uh, we're looking for what are some of the features that could be added to a manufacturer home that don't affect your HUD uh, code and certification uh, standards. Uh, so I will just say in general, most resiliency features, uh, if thoughtfully installed and applied, should not really impact that. Um, some of the things that we've been seeing done as a resiliency measure with manufactured housing is um, elevating the house by elevating the land, kind of creating a small hill or berm. So rather than creating a structure to elevate and place the manufactured housing uh, home onto, uh, you can do that with just a, a land base. Um, so that's one way to get it elevated and out of floodways. Um, the independent power connections, such as a permanent generator. So again, we, we don't allow uh, payment for um, temporary generators, but we can certainly have a permanent backup generator, just like we do with regular housing, um, supporting the manufactured house uh, so that, again, when there's power outages or disasters that occur that um, force people to leave their homes because they can't uh, receive power or water, um, having some backup redundancy in systems there is another resiliency measure that should not, if properly installed, impact the HUD certification. A few others, tornado shelters or safe rooms, those can be installed on sites. Uh, they're not really impacting the manufacturer housing box. Uh, tree clearances, so again, if you need some setbacks or if you need to do some um, site work to uh, pro protect the manufacturer housing from forest fires or related uh, impacts like that, that can be used. Um, community water hookups. So again, um, this is like having a central fire hose in the in the uh, resident-owned community or just the general uh, manufactured housing uh, neighborhood. 
So if you have some centralized uh, public water access to put out fires and to dampen areas to prevent fire from catching on, that's another resiliency measure that we're seeing recently in, in those types of disasters. And then um, non-combustible sh shingles is yet another. So um, debris and ash falling from um, mostly forest fires uh, events uh, that will then ignite uh, asphalt or other types of shingles, um, wood shake shingles, those kinds of things. You can buy um, non-combustible shingles now and use those as a as a feature that could not really have any uh, impact on your hard surface condition for the home. If anything, all of those features enhance it. Sustainability and energy efficiency. So um, this could go on a long time, but what is the average lifespan of a manufactured home? It's really going to vary. Uh, it depends on when it was manufactured. Uh, so to what standards at the time was it made? So how old is it? Um, where is it located? Um, and uh, how well has it been maintained? Uh, are all factors that impact on the lifestyle, uh, the lifespan of the home and whether it needs to be repaired or replaced. Um, generally, if it's well con uh, constructed and it's been up, uh, well maintained and kept up with, um, can last a very long time. The same as really a stick built home. So I, I would say that it, it, there are too many variables to say what, a, you know, a standard uh, number of years is, but I would say it's very comparable to stick built and it's mostly impacted by these features. Uh, do manufactured homes constructed according to the HUD code meet energy star ratings and are they assessed for energy efficiency by a qualified rater? So um, it's not mandated that the home meet an energy star uh, requirement in, in order to be labeled as a manufactured home with the HUD code. Um, and many uh, state or local codes, uh, I will just say uh, already meet or exceed the energy star standards. So all things being equal, if it's uh, delivered, installed and, and properly maintained, um, it's very likely that it could or will. Um, in order for it to meet the Energy Star requirements, you're going to have to separately certify that. So, because Energy Star is its own certification program, you would need to follow the guidelines from EPA's Energy Star program. So, I think that answers that question. When does HUD expect the energy efficiency updates to be changed and implemented? So, uh, in coordination with the Department of Energy, They've already established some conservation standards for manufacturer homes, and there is the link 10 CFR part 460 uh, that you can find what those are, but um, they are being enforced, enforced by uh, the Department of Energy, not HUD, so you would have to follow their guidelines for that. And then HUD is in the process of aligning these uh, in the manufactured home construction and safety standards with what DOE has been working on. So. Um, there's no current timeline or um, sense of when that alignment will have occurred and be formally uh, laid out, but know that it's coming. Another section is taxes, title, insurance, and um, financing. So let's hit those questions. Okay, question 24. What factors determine if a manufactured home is financed as real property or personal property? So again, in the earlier presentations, we went into a little more depth on the distinction between the two. Um, it matters because that will impact the types of financing sources and a lot of your policy and procedure as well. Um, and again, as was noted earlier, if it's personal property, it creates some uh, further cha challenges in terms of eligible use. Um, so whether a manufactured home is financed as uh, real or personal property is going to depend on all of these factors that we've listed here. Uh, is it permanently affixed? Is it titled as real or personal property based on um, the standards in your state or locale? Um, what do the local regulations say in terms of how to, to treat this uh, type of housing? And then um, as is coming and as it's being discussed, the lender and insurance guidelines are now starting to help clarify some of that. So you're really, it's going to depend. Um, what are some options to affix a manufactured home to a permanent foundation so that it can be treated as real property? So um, some of the options for that uh, can include concrete piers, concrete slabs, or a full basement as we see in this photo to the right here. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of types of foundations that would be um, amenable for a regular stick built home that can also be uh, just slightly modified or used for manufactured 
uh, homes that are delivered to the site and installed on the pad. Um, compliance with your local building codes and the HUD requirements and aligning those is crucial for classifying it as real property. And that's uh, important because that's going to impact what types of financing products you can use. And there's a lot of guidelines on this uh, through this link under the HUD's permanent foundation guide for manufactured housing. So if you want to get into the weeds and the details on it, follow that guidebook. Next question was, how are taxes uh, typically assessed on manufactured homes? Again, um, this it's going to be impacted by the whether it's considered real property or personal property. That's going to certainly have an impact on the type of tax assessment you do and how it's applied. Um, and so that's going to also vary from locale to locale. And um, if it's affixed to the permanent foundation and um, you know it's got it meets the HUD code, then it's presumably going to meet your standards as real property, um, and that comes along with the land uh, rights as well. If it's considered personal property, then annual personal property taxes may be assessed instead of real estate taxes and some of the valuation for that may change as well. Um, and it's gonna really vary depending on what that local statute says in terms of their tax assessment and tax codes. Okay, so we made it with five minutes to spare for Q and A period. I don't know if we've been receiving uh, questions um, online. So I'm going to take just a minute here to open up uh, to the team to see if there are any common themes or questions that have been uh, popping up as we've been covering these with all of you and if there's um, anything else we can address. Yeah, so um, we do not have very many questions. Um, one that is a note that I actually think is um, a great suggestion and wanted to share it with everyone. Um, in regards to uh, locating data on pre-1976 mobile homes and um, how many of those exist within a community, um, someone noted that local information can often be obtained in the business or personal property department within the tax administration office. Um, so that might look a little different for your locality, um, but in general, I think that's a great suggestion for where you could start trying to find that information. So I wanted to share that. Um, with everyone and then we do have um, we have a question so um, the question is I know this webinar is in regards to CDBG but can home funds be used for manufactured housing uh, is my understanding that typically manufactured housing is not allowable um, with the home investment partnership program is this incorrect um, so the answer to that is that um, there are activities with manufactured housing that can be funded with home Funds. Um, so in webinar three, where we talked about, um, we, we really focused hard on um, using the, the different federal funding sources for manufactured housing activities. So um, those materials are, uh, I believe the slides and transcript are posted. Um, the recording is coming, but um, there is much more information in that. And then as well, um, there is a link in the chat to the, um, the HUD CPD notice on um, manufactured housing activities that can be undertaken in the home program. So there is a specific notice that goes a lot deeper on that subject. Um, so we did have one more question come through and I think we have another minute or two. So just wanted to um, put this out there. Did HUD include requirements in their new manufactured home standards for fire resistant construction to improve safety for use in wildland urban interface areas? Um, so that is a specific question and um, I'm not sure if we maybe need to research that one a little bit further and provide follow up information later. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and call out that question as well. Um, so we, we can follow up on that. And then um, another question came through, how, does manu how do manufactured homes pair up against multifamily homes as a solution to affordability, particularly with the push towards rezoning areas for more density? So um, I think there's a lot of pros and cons, so it, it sort of just depends on the specific area. Um, the specific uh, land use requirements for a different area, um, but and and then just the, the specific density considerations for an area. So I'm not sure if anyone else has anything to add on that. Um, I'll just 
say thank you for the question. I don't know that I've seen any studies that have done that direct comparison, but if we find anything, we will follow up uh, from these webinars with more information on it. Yeah. Um, those are great, really specific questions. Uh, I did want to also just point out that we have a couple of slides that include some resources um, for where you can go to get more information on various aspects of manufactured housing. So um, some of these are the same links that we've included in the slides, but a couple of them are just additional resources that we thought would be um, would be helpful for folks. So just wanted to call out to everyone that those are here. Um, so it looks like we're right on time. So um, we thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, we do have one more webinar in the series. It's on manufactured housing and tribal communities. And that is going to be um, next Wednesday, December 6th at this same time. So hopefully you all can join us for that as well. And so thank you so much for uh, your attention today and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care everyone, bye.